Let's look at going going by uh, Philip Larkin. Uh, this was the poem I looked at a bit in um, my Substack last week, <laughs> the new scrapbook. So Larkin, 1922 to 1985, uh, British poet, very uh, famous British poet in, uh, at, through his time, I think, uh, oddly eclipsed. Uh, now, I think for various reasons, um, but I would argue that he is probably, uh, well, this way, he's one of the best 20th century British poets, 20th century English language poets. Uh, we've looked at Les Murray, who, I mean, he lived till 2019, so he's very much a 21st century poet too, but he's another one of the kind of, for me, great English language 20th century poets, um, and, and there, are, there, are, there are there are many. I mean, Eliot is is probably the greatest, uh, but yeah, Larkin. Let's say post-war, I'd say Larkin is the best British poet uh, or British and Irish poet, uh, and then you have people like Hughes and, and Haney um, and others coming up behind. And he is um, maybe most notable for just being, in some ways, quite grumpy and gloomy. Um, it, I wouldn't want to say cynical. I think actually there's uh, a surprising lack of cynicism the more you read of him. There are moments you, you first strike hit at some of his poems and he he's comes across as very negative, uh, very cynical. But then you read stuff that, uh, you you know, really, we're, we're talking about sadness. He's sad. Uh, and when another mood takes him or when something deeper touches him, uh, then he's not sad. He is uh, hopeful and clean and bright. Um, uh, going, going is very much in the gloomy camp. And it was, I read that it was uh, written as a commission on behalf of the government who wanted a prefatory poem for uh, how do we live? You know, kind of like, what are we going to do next kind of report? Um, and <laughs> he wrote this and um, I think it's that they, did, they didn't take it up. Uh, but I'll read it. Going going this this I, I though i've seen some draft dates that go a lot earlier i think this is 1972 and it's included in his last uh, collection high windows i thought it would last my time the sense that beyond the town there would always be fields and farms where the village louts could climb such trees as were not cut down i knew there'd be false alarms in the papers about old streets and split level shopping but some had always been left so far and when the old park retreats and the bleak high rises come we can always escape in the car Things are tougher than we are, just as Earth will always respond. How have we messed it about? Chuck filth in the sea if you must. The ties will be clean beyond. But what do I feel now? Doubt? Or age, simply. The crowd is young in the M1 cafe. Their kids are screaming for more. More houses, more parking allowed, more caravan sites, more pay. On the business page, a score of spectacled grins approve some takeover bid that entails 5% profit and 10% more in the estuaries. Move your works to the unsport dales, grey area grants, and when you try to get near the sea in summer, it seems just now to be happening so very fast. Despite all the land left free, for the first time I feel somehow that it isn't going to last. But before I snuff it, the whole boiling will be bricked in except for the tourist parts first slum of Europe, a role it won't be hard to win with a cast of crooks and tarts. And that will be England gone. The shadows, the meadows, the lanes, the guild halls, the carved choirs. There'll be books, it will linger on in galleries, but all that will remain for us will be concrete and tyres. Most things are never meant. This won't be most likely, but greeds and garbage are too thick strewn to be swept up now, or invent excuses that make them all needs. I just think it will happen. Soon. Going, going, relates ultimately to England gone. This It's as if England is for sale uh, at an auction. That'll be England gone. This is about post-war development, I guess, building, um, you know, whether it's house building, road building, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, and obviously Larkin feels a sense of desecration. I think there's a thing here... Um, when we come to a poem, and I, uh, I, I've touched on this before, but some people will hear this and think this is dreadfully negative and um, downbeat, and uh, in fact, uh, it, it's politically unreliable. Um, and uh, you know, there's a there, there's a a negative uh, an anti-Soviet wrecking attitude here. Um, 
when we come to something that we're not quite sure about, it's okay, you know, certainly it's okay to feel like that. But I think um, art at some level, I believe, uh, exists uh, beyond the moment and beyond uh, the writer and even in some ways beyond the exact sentiment. You know, uh, just watching yesterday, uh, William Kloss talk about uh, Don uh, Donatello's David, which is a marvellous statue. And he talks and speculates about the kind of personal motivations there that some people come up with to do with things in the, in that sculpture. Um, and you have to be able to take a step back and say, OK, that might be the case, but I don't care. Um, I mean, Donatello is long dead. He's not benefiting from me liking it or disliking it. Um, so let me kind of deal with this at the level of it being um, an artistic communication as well as anything else. You can always talk about the other stuff. So when we when we read something which might not be to our taste, uh, we should, um, I think, uh, and here Larkin is so explicitly grumpy, so explicitly reactionary, that many people will find this is not to their taste. Uh, we should still give it space. Um, Larkin is actually a formalist. Uh, he uh, he feels like, and, and in many respects really is, uh, the last kind of thoroughgoing formalist in in meter and, and uh, scansion and, and rhyme and stuff um, in major poet in, in English. Uh, remember, Eliot is, is a formalist of a kind, but not really. I mean, he's a, he sometimes is actively vers libre in, in, uh, in Eliot. We, we talked about that in our two-part two series on landscapes. Larkin, on the other hand, uh, not every time he does he, I say this very occasionally, I think there's stuff like, is it is days and water? I think those are both poems where he... Uh, he is is just using some sort of free verse, uh, but m most often he's using regular uh, meters and regular rhyme schemes. And this is this one is a pretty uh, easy one for most of us, I think, to diagnose. So we can time town farms, climb down alarms. Okay, so it's got an A B C rhyme scheme, uh, and that is essentially the the same the way through. Um, you have the one exception here. We'll, we'll touch on this. That's A, that's B, that's C, that's A, B, C. Uh, this, in fact, is still the same in summer, and it seems just now uh, runs the same line length as the other, if you combine the two, but um, we'll come back to that. So, yes, regular rhyme scheme and regular line lengths they're basically most of them seven uh, seven syllables i thought it would last my time the sense that beyond the uh, sorry, the sense that beyond the town there would always be fields and farms that's eight where the village louts could climb seven again such trees as were not cut down I knew there'd be false uh, alarms. So you've got seven to eight as the standard. And that, that runs throughout. As Earth will always respond, however we mess it about. So um, that I think is, is it that most of the third lines are eight have always been left so far? No, I don't think so. I think it's just a, a couple of the middle lines are eight. Um, but yes, so regu regular... Uh, line length, regular um, rhyme scheme, and uh, there's yeah. Uh, in ter in terms of um, you know st stresses, he he ver he varies, I think a bit, um, and a lot of it is quite flat reading. I thought it I thought it would last my time. Um, is you know you've got n not heavy stresses throughout time is certainly stressed, but you know you've got a fairly uh, flat laconic line I don't mean in a literal Spartan sense I mean as in he is really delivering it in a very the sense that beyond the town there would always be fields and farms always you know be fields and farms where the village louts could climb such trees so again got a few in each line out of seven syllables there, there are often only a couple of very strong stresses and then maybe some soft stresses this is it adds to the gloominess that the natural delivery of this in natural English is quite flat. I knew there'd be false alarms. False. Um, yeah, he, uh, he he's uh, using um, the... Uh, well, I suppose one thing, why, is, why does he use rhyme and meter? Well, because 
uh, partly probably because he's a reactionary and he is suspicious, uh, correctly, of the excesses of free verse. Um, it's something where Larkin, use, you know, restraint, uh, constraint um, is valuable uh, to any artist, you know, knowing knowing our craft is valuable. And here, um, the, you know, this is probably second nature to him at some level. Uh, but I think it, it's also the rhyme and, me and, and, and regular meter do... Uh, naturally guide us, don't they, in terms of the meter here is part of what means that, <clears throat> that it's not incredibly musical. We've talked about lyricism or musicality before. Uh, though this is very uh, poetically sound, it's not terribly musical. Um, we have lots of, uh, I mean, false alarms, louts, cut down, um, you know, certainly not much beauty being described there. Uh, and uh, certainly when we look at things like uh, louts or split level shopping, the young in uh, the crowd is young in the M1 cafe. The kids are screaming for more. The business pages, five percent profit, first slum of Europe, crooks and tarts, greeds and garbage are too thick strewn. Um, you know the imagery is not uh, certainly it's not beautiful, but often it's it's harsh, uh, even where it's not kind of highly consonantal uh, and and literally verbally harsh. Um, you know, it's using slang and unpoetic words, and that's that's typical of Larkin. Uh, at least after his, um, I say, I said High Winners was the third collection. No, it's his fourth. After the North Ship, his first collection, which has more traditional things in it, um, from so the less deceived, the Wits and Weddings and High Windows, uh, all rely a lot more on this vernacular, um, and uh, it's so word choice um, it, there sets a scene which meter helps guide you along uh, and the rhymes kind of give, give this an insistent sense of rhythm they're not very strong rhymes what i mean is they're not the kind of uh say how can man die better than facing fearful odds for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods bam bam you know the the, the meter um is bouncing and the um the line ending rhyme is uh, very visible as it were, I mean, audible, but visible, you know, we, it's just there. I thought it would last my time, the sense that beyond the town there would always be fields and farms, where the village louts could climb, such trees as were not cut down. I knew there'd be false alarms. The, the, the rhymes are there. Once once you're paying attention, you know, it's not like they're invisible. But they're not um, resounding, and they're not meant to be resounding. They're just, a, an, I think, an oral clue um, to the form and to the the rhythm and there are by the way, classic there are other things he's using to uh communicate um the poetic nature here you know ff and then um you simply have where's my cursor gone yeah you've got s s s s s you have a lot of S's in those three lines. Um, these, uh, you, you can see, by the way, these are also six, generally speaking, uh, six line verses. Um, in the paper about old streets and split-level shopping, but some have always been left so far. You know, there, there's this regular uh, use of the S there. So he, he's got plenty of little poetic tricks. But what about the... The meat. Oh, actually, let's just address uh, down here. You try to get near the sea in summer. Ellipsis. It seems just now. But in summer, it seems just now, as we've established, our one line. They count to seven. Seven syllables. Um, there's only one rhyme on that, it seems just now. Uh, but here, this is uh, poetry as punctuation. Uh, it is a different kind of punctuation system to prose. In prose, uh, you're not allowed to have a set, have an entire line or, you know, a paragraph or whatever which consists of it seems comma just now comma space you know like and then line break you're not allowed to do that that's bad here of course is perfectly normal we, we accept that but here he's he's twisting that further you try to get near the sea in summer it seems just now now if there's no ellipsis we run on you try to get near the sea in summer it seems just now. except then we realize you try to get near the sea in summer is not a complete sentence here with some poetic contraction, he's generally using full sentences or nearly full sentences. Right? You know, that, that seems seems clear. And that's pretty typical for most of his work. He um, is 
uh, not highly compressed. But here he breaks a thought. You try to get near the sea, near the sea in summer. No pause. Uh, he lived up relatively near the sea. He lived in Hull. Um, he's li university librarian there. He obviously died not young, young, but relatively young. He's sixty-three or whatever. Uh, he hadn't retired, um, and uh, he, uh, yeah, he could have quickly driven from there to the Yorkshire coast and give him an hour, and he's really up onto some of the pretty bits of the Yorkshire coast. Uh, but he, his sense is, you know, everything's filling up. This is a big part here. Um, I should say because because people will wonder, and I this is something that um, uh, I did observe uh, offhand in in a point of my Substack is that when you read uh, about Larkin looking at change in Britain, um, he does not think first and foremost at this point. Uh, you know what his views now would be. Um, one we don't know, and two uh, we can speculate uh, with probably some accuracy the more we read him. But his concern here is not, for instance, what we might think now to do with uh, uh, countries filling up and people assume that's rhetoric to do with migration. Uh, Larkin simply isn't talking about that. He's talking about ordinary ordinary stuff, ordinary British stuff, you know, ordinary British building, ordinary British young people and families and the M1 cafe. Uh, the point he, he's getting at here is um, a sense of shift and change from when he was young, his perceptions when young, and we'll return to that, to his um his sense that he tries to go to the seaside and presumably it's just full you try to get near the sea in summer it seems to be happening that uh, just now to be happening so very fast despite the land that they're free that for the first time i feel somehow it isn't going to last um of course there's something where he initially says yeah i always thought this was false 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 alarms uh, but in the papers about old streets and split level shopping uh, but some have always been left so far uh, here I think about the idea, you know, you go to somewhere like Salisbury and uh, you have these beautiful medieval buildings with plate glass windows in the front. The sense of real vandalism in the 60s, both demolitions, and you get it in America too, you know, um, think about uh, Penn Station. Um, you get the, the demolition of magnificent buildings and beautiful buildings and uh, sticking, I mean, it was, uh, I mentioned, uh, I think I did explicitly mention this in the Substack, uh, the great medieval city of Chester in Britain, um, mag beautiful walls. Uh, sticking a ring road through the inter uh, the inside of the city um, and on one part where there's not a big enough gate uh, just demolishing a section of the wall and demolishing uh, you know splitting up um, parts of the city and then running through a suburb on the other side and just demolishing that uh, and uh, you know we, we, maybe there's points for efficiency in in the Chester inner ring road uh, but it's something which uh, is so unnatural. You see lots of this kind of town planning stuff go wrong. Basically, there's a big thing here that undeniably uh, choices are made that go wrong. And Larkin is picking it up at the time that, um, you know, that they are um, changing the landscape, demolishing and rebuilding. Uh, and it's something that even, uh, but he, he says even, you know, after we um, have accepted this is happening we can always run away you know we can always escape in the car things are tougher than we are he's giving his excuses just as earth will always respond however we mess with about there is actually a proto-environmentalism here by that i mean you can just hear the sense that he says look you know we everything is very resilient we shouldn't worry too much um but what do i feel now doubt you know uh, that applies to the tides too i don't think larkin of all people would have thought we should actually just chuck loads of plastic in the sea his point was that you might think oh yes it's resilient but he does think ah maybe there is a limit to these things maybe eventually the capacity of or the plasticity of something uh, ends he does and he does question himself just a little bit he's not um larkin doubt or age simply what do i feel now doubt or age maybe nothing's gone wrong maybe i'm just an old fogey you know he's um he's 50 here uh, and uh, he's he's lived lifetimes really you know he's uh um he's a grumpy old man the crowd is young in the m1 cafe the kids are screaming for more more houses more parking allowed more caravan sites more pay and i think if you said to larkin to, should these people simply live nowhere i'm thinking about you know th this is a modern debate he you know he would probably say he'd probably accept the fact that it's natural that people wanted more i think he'd, he's grumpy enough to say no they should just li don't don't care stop ruining everything 
Um, but you can tell that he would sense or feel something like, you know, he'd understand that people did want housing, did want places to go, did need car. You try to park somewhere with kids, you know, I've got four kids, you drive somewhere and, uh, um, you know, you find that the uh, uh, it's over parked and over busy, partly for people who are going to places, not even the location you're, you're going to, um, uh, or the parking's ages away, or the parking's really tight. Uh, this seems like a frivolous thing, but you notice this stuff um, in the oversaturated, you know, car parking um, that you deal with in most towns. And uh, going out of town to out of town, in, you know, industrial parks or commercial car parks, he wouldn't be comforted by that. He wouldn't think, oh, that's much better. Hopefully we can just have a lot of those. Especially because they're connected in town planning terms to the withering of city centres, town centres. Um, on the business pages, a score of Spectacle Grins approves some takeover bin that entails for, uh, bid that entails 5% profit and 10% more in the estuary. Here is very unpoetic language. This is, of course, mocking at some level. Move your works to the Unsport Dales, grey area grants. The idea that actually, you know, look, these places are grey areas. They're not being used for anything. So you can get business tax rate breaks if you go and build on them. The sense that, um, well, we've got here the, the cast of crooks and tarts. You know, he, he sees things that do seem like, to him, decline. And we might say, well, a lot of this is necessary progress, Phil. You know, people need houses. We need to make money somehow so that there there is an economy, especially post-Empire. Well, we could have a rational discussion here, but his point is not that. His point is the sense of rapid and revolutionary social change um, marked here by um, the... The, the leap to build, the leap to make money, you know, a kind of explicit, um, we might think in Gordon Gecko terms, greed is good. Uh, though for him, crooks and tarts, uh, another word that comes to mind is spivs, the idea that, um, you know, this is classless, unclassy, poor, common. I don't mean poor in terms of lack of money, but just as a poor show. Uh, common to our American viewers is, is not a, a British word re uh, denoting commoner. Um, it's a it's a moral um, pejorative. Uh, the, he, and he thinks now, even though there's all the land left free, the point here is not about literally the amount of land being built on, but um, what use is made of it and what you can do with that. And there there is a sense there, you know, you 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 uh, you know listen to people say, oh well, look, I'm thinking of the political economist Tom Harwood. Is that his name? Who'll regularly um when flying in a plane he'll take a photo out the window and say oh look england's full he means you know of course there's loads of space to build look all this countryside is um i think there's probably some sort of weird dissonance in in taking a photo of a beautiful landscape and saying we could just build on it and larkin would certainly feel that dissonance but the point is you know the point is many of us can notice this when you're in built up areas you think ah i remember you used to be able to walk out to the you know there'd just be endless country that way and now there's it's a bit more disrupted it's more broken up uh, there's less um there's less great green space to wander in um outside of going to uh, the um re you know the national parks basically uh, and he sees it uh, it's interesting the whole boiling will be written here he has a couple of things where he simply stops using words in normal ways most of what we've seen above is actually pretty normal use but the whole boiling boiling here um you know I guess a, a verbal adjective a part or a participle um, is used as a noun. The whole boiling, everything is boiling. Everything is hot. The sense that um, is uh, everything is coming to a a, 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 tip, a tipping point. Perhaps it'll be bricked in, except for the tourist parts. Uh, so the idea that yes, you'll be allowed to go and see some nice things, but they'll be fake. First slum of Europe. A role it won't be hard to win with a class of cooks and t crooks and tarts. Um, uh, that's interesting as well, the kind of negativity about Britain compared to Europe. Not because he thinks it has been terrible, but the sense of we won't preserve our own stuff. And that'll be England gone. So it's been sold. It's been sold to the crooks and tarts. Uh, the shadows, meadows, lanes, the guild halls, the carved choirs. There'll be books or linger on in galleries. Of course, he doesn't mean every guild hall, every carved choir, every meadow will have been demolished. But he means the sense of an England that to him is being defined... And he, he lived in a, an industrial city, so we're not talking about someone who, who simply had no idea. But here, this is this England, um, the, this this place of, let's say, peaceful and quiet. Um, and of course, you could say to him, 
why didn't this all start changing with the cotton gin and uh, with the uh, uh, <laughs> with um, fire in the landscape? You can see those Industrial Revolution paintings from the 18th century. Come on, Phil. This has been going on for ages. But of course, the fact the process has been going on for ages, one, doesn't mean we always notice it, and two, um, doesn't make it untraumatic. Uh, and I think um, he he has a perception perhaps romanticised, and he's not, that's what I mean, he's not cynical in the way we might think the cynic would say, huh, I never was in England, huh, choirs, huh, guild halls. You know, the sniffing and snarling of the cynic uh, is not here. This is something where he really loves this image or dream of England, which may or may not be a real one. It is at least to him real. Um, but his sense that we'll be able to go and see bits. There'll be books that will linger on in galleries for us will be concrete and tyres. Um, and this goes back to the tourist parts being being left preserved. Here's a question that, um, you know, there, there, there's an, 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 a noumena, I guess, that worries me. Is that how would I know? I was born in 1987, I'm, you know, 15 years after this. Um, how would I really know if this was true or false? I think this is an interesting thing about reading things in the past, isn't it? Is... Um, One's instinct may be to think this is true or false, depending on one's political predilections. Oh, everything's gotten worse, so I agree. Or things have all gotten better, so I disagree. You know, the sense of what we think has generally been happening. Um, but there is a voice from the past here who is saying, I feel like things were like this, and they've changed. And they changed in, uh, particularly here, I guess you think, in the American term is urban real, isn't it? In the renewal of the 60s. Um, how would we know different uh, now? Uh, people who are alive before will remember, of course, uh, people who are adults in the 60s, particularly, I'm thinking, uh, as a good comparison. But it does strike me that this is uh, part of this experience of reading from the past, um, that 1972 is now, it's 52 years ago, it's now long enough ago that um, it is a voice from the past warning us or mourning of something which we may not recognise. I think... Um, I'm thinking about, you know, when you get notes uh, on classic poem, classics poems, you know, you're reading Virgil and it'll say, oh, he's referring to this wide known practice of this or at the time or, you know, um, ah, uh, this this is the mythical reference. It's not a famous one. It's a very minor one. But it's something we wouldn't even, most of us who even know a bit of ancient mythology would have no idea about. And I think that's, um, yeah, there's a, a thing there where, I don't, does that date this poem or does this make this? Uh, more eternal in its own way that it is the, the a permanent expression of the mourning that we have when we see what we believe are good old things going or is it that we respond and say well this is simply the outdated claptrap of uh, an odd reactionary I don't know but there are some great but nonetheless this is what makes me think there is a, an eternal sentiment here is most things you know we come to it here let's listen not that it hasn't come up before but most things are never meant that is a lark in line to take away. This won't be most likely, but greeds, again, we're turning greeds into a plural. And garbage, we're also seeing as a physical plural, you know, physical object. It's strewn across with the garbage we swept at now. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, we can't even invent excuses that make the greeds and garbages needs. I just think it'll happen soon. He, he's not, he's prophesying not in the strict sense of, oh, this has happened and this is what's going to happen next. He's just saying, look, there's this process that I'm describing that is happening and I can't, maybe it's just me being old and grumpy, uh, but I think it's happening. And I think that destruction of good things is not meant. Most things are never meant. Um, it is experience unable to convince or communicate to, to youth. Um, it is, you know, and and it doesn't matter whether experience has it all right, but it is this recurring human experience, isn't it? That experience cannot speak to youth, cannot convince youth. The young crowd want all these things. Uh, people understand we want to make money, and so you are talking about building on the um, uh, on the dales. Uh, but but this is something that valuable once lost will not be. A, we can't regain it. And in fact, as I observe, we don't, we don't even know if we really lost it or whether this was simply fictional. Um, and that is something I think quite poignant and quite powerful. Um, I think the mourning in that will be England gone. Uh, and because he, and particularly what he defines as England, 
we can call it naive or romantic. We certainly can't call it cynical, as I say. But again, it's the sincere and real emotion of something loved, destroyed. Um, you know, I guess you can imagine it uh, in a sport. You know, think about people talking about soccer and the the, uh, the financialization of soccer. Think about people um, might might talk about it to do with their church denomination. Um, or whatever else you know all these things where something loved is destroyed uh, and it can be something coded as conservative it can be something coded as liberal i don't that doesn't really matter we're talking here about the sentiment the eternal sentiment here that will be england gone most things are never meant uh, so yeah that is larkin going going it's a bit a bit different to some of our previous ones you know we've had uh, um reflection on uh, on the aging process in old time childhood in Kentucky, we've got beauty in Snowdrop, um, and religion in Him to God My God, and we've got you know the uh, use of uh, landscape to communicate the human journey in landscapes. But here we have a very personal, very direct. I thought it last my time. Um, elegy uh, in in rough and rough and simple, intentionally rough and simple language and strong poetic form. Um, I think there's something very different about Larkin, which, uh, yeah, is worth, some of you may, may not know him, and I, I certainly commend him. But yeah, tell me what you think in the comments, and I will see you next time.